just to let everyone know, the service will be starting in three minutes. If you're watching from home, hello and welcome. Looking forward to seeing you when the service starts at 10.30.
we're going to start off with a, a verse from the New Testament, which just points towards the identity of the snake. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient snake called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So it's quite a somber tone for the start of our service. But we also want to celebrate what Jesus has done with us. So we're going to sing our first song, which is Look and See. And there's an amazing chorus where it says, Oh, look and see our God and celebrate the power of the cross and the empty grave. And now we're free. Let the redeemed lift up your heads. Oh, look and see our God. So we really do want to celebrate what Jesus achieved, even as we think about the seriousness of sin. everyone this morning and if I can add my welcome to that of Simon's at the beginning. Just a couple of brief things to draw to your attention by way of uh, notices today. Um, as Simon said do please stay for lunch. We're saying farewell to David and Hannah Casey who uh, David has been uh, one of our elders ward wardens since the start of our church three years ago and Hannah has been on our council and they've meant so much to all of us as a church and we're looking forward to uh, saying a few words to thank them. We've got a couple of gifts for them as well. So do stay around, and uh, if you haven't got food, do nip next door and uh, buy something. You'd be most welcome to stay. There is another bring and share lunch. Today is bring your own lunch, but the next one will be a bring and share lunch on the 7th of November when we uh, have a Thanksgiving service for little Jessica Paulette. We're really looking forward to that. 
Um, three brief things to point to on the website. The first is that if you click on this banner on the website, you'll get to our page that's got all of the information about the Genesis series that we've been doing. It includes all the past sermons on this series, if you've missed any, and also a question and answer that we had last week on the theme of sexuality and the handout and the talk from Chris Lowe's uh, talk last Sunday night. If you click on register, which is up at the top right, um, you will be able to get a weekly email. And rather than me saying every week everything that happens in the week, um, if you register with our weekly news, you'll get an email which tells you everything and all the dates. There's also a calendar function on the website, um, which has all the dates and the locations of the different meetings written out. So um, those are the, the important things um, that you need to know for today. I'm going to hand over now to Katie, and uh, she's going to lead us into a couple of things. Hello. Well, our first thing is the kids' spot. So, children, if you'd like to come up to the front. Um, and as you do that, today's story is a little bit funny and a little bit strange, so we're going to work hard to understand what it means for us. But who can remember what our series is on at the moment? We're looking at an animal through the Bible. Donkey, donkey William, it is the donkey, well done. Well, Joshua said it too, well done. Um, so today's story comes from the book of Judges, which is a book in the Old Testament of the Bible. And it's quite a long story, so we're going to zoom in on a particular part of it. If you want to hear the rest of the story, then ask your mums and dads. And mums and dads, good luck with that one. Um, so we're zooming in. So I need a few volunteers. Well, actually, I need all of you to be involved in this. So first of all, we're thinking about a man called Samson. Who would like to be Samson? Hepsburg, do you want to come up? So um, do you want to come and stand over here for me? Thank you very much. So Samson is a man in the Old Testament. He's one of God's people. Um, and he was very strong. So can you, can you be strong? Excellent. Well done. Um, right, all the rest of you, do you want to come over on this side? Okay, thank you. So you guys are the Philistines. They are God's enemies. They don't like God's people. So can you look a bit cross and grumpy? <laughs> yeah. So... Um, so there's quite a few of them, and actually in the Bible story, there are a thousand of them, okay? So you need to pretend that there's not just, one, two, three, four, there's not just six of them, but there are a thousand, okay? Yeah, and it's just you on your own. Okay, so to make matters worse, you're tied up, so can you just hold that bit of rope? It's actually a curtain tie, but a bit of rope. So you're tied up, Samson is tied up. Okay, how are you feeling? Hang on, let me just turn on my microphone. How are you feeling about your situation? You're, you're stuck, you're tied up, and it's just you against a thousand of the scary Philistines. I'm a bit nervous. A bit nervous, okay. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Okay, but the story doesn't end there, because you've got something to help you. Okay, so what, what do you think you might like to help you in this situation? A gun. A gun, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you haven't got a gun. What you've got is this. I don't know if you can see that very well, but it's a bit of a donkey, which is how it links to our series on donkeys. It's a donkey's jawbone. It's this bit of a donkey. Okay, so that's what you've got. You've got that lying nearby. So that, that looks really helpful, doesn't it? How, how do you feel now? No, yeah, not, not any better. Okay, great. I'm not surprised, to be honest. Okay, and then we've got one more piece of our puzzle, okay, which is this verse from Judges 15. It says this. It says, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. So, oh, I forgot to give you your donkey's jawbone. Hang on. Here we go. I don't actually own a donkey's jawbone. So, a wooden spoon. So, you can hold a wooden spoon. That's what you've got to help you. But you've now got the spirit of the Lord come powerfully upon you. So, how do you feel now? A uh, braver. A bit braver. That's great, isn't it? Okay. Right. So, the story in Judges 15 tells us that actually Samson armed with just a donkey's jawbone, that weird thing we saw on the screen, managed to defeat a thousand Philistines. So do you want to go and defeat them gently? <laughs> Yay, well done. And Philistines, you can all lie down. Ugh. Hey, well done. Great, right. Get a round of applause for our actors. You can sit down. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you very much. So that story is a bit difficult to understand, isn't it? But what it shows us 
is that God is incredibly powerful. That situation with Samson looked a bit hopeless, didn't it? It was just him on his own. He was tied up. It was just him against a thousand Philistines. And because God was with him, he was able to win. And it looked like a hopeless situation, but he was able to win. So we know that God is incredibly powerful and he wins in hopeless situations. And do you know what it reminded me a bit of? It reminded me a bit of Jesus. Um, Because Jesus once was tied up. He was tied up on a cross. Um, And that looked pretty hopeless, didn't it? Because it was just Jesus against all of his enemies. And that looked like a really hopeless situation. Um, And worse still, he died. He died on that cross. That's a dreadfully hopeless situation, isn't it? But then three days later, he rose from the dead and he defeated the hardest of all the enemies. He defeated sin and death. So God wins in every hopeless situation, not just Samson and the Philistines, but against death and the world. That's amazing. Shall I say a prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you that you are incredibly powerful and that you win in hopeless situations. Amen. Um, We're now going to sing two songs. The first one is called Jesus Strong and Kind. So like Samson was strong, Jesus is also strong. But Samson wasn't actually, if you read the story in Judges, he wasn't actually incredibly kind. He was a bit of a confusing hero of the Bible. But Jesus was strong and kind and loving. So we're going to sing that and then we're going to sing another song which is perhaps a bit more new to us. Um, So we can listen to that. God did make him really strong. We've got some instruments if anyone, any other children want to play the instrument. should come to him. 
what a privilege we have been given, made in His image, giving dominion, ruling creation, all that He designed. Rivers and oceans, mountains and flowers came into being, all by His power, God's good creation, finished with mankind. Grab a seat. Thank you. Um, it's almost time for the children to go out. So we've got children's groups today. So um, Emma heads up our kids' work. So Emma gives away there she is. Um, and Alice heads up our safeguarding. So if anyone's new and wants to chat to either of them about those things, then that's who they are. Um, so firstly, we've got Scramblers, which is our noughts to threes. They meet in the music room, which is just through the door on the left, follow someone else with a small child. Um, and Joe Watson's leading that for us today. Thank you, Joe. Um, we've got Great Sunday Morning Adventurers, which is for age three to six. Sevens, and that's with Emma and someone. Great, lovely. It's, it's all rolling. Um, and that's in the community room, so follow Emma and Joe. Um, and then we've got Trogs, which is for our eight to 11 year olds, and that's with John Gilbert and Sarah Gertler. And you guys, I don't actually have a clue where Trogs leads, but. You're in that way, in the staff room. Oh, exciting. Um, and then also tonight for our older um, youth, we've got CCHY, which is for 11 to 18s, and that's with Matt, Sarah, Sarah, and Emily, um, and that's at 75 Thames Road. Um, so it's time to go to your groups. Um, 
adults and have a nice chat with someone next to you or across the room and we'll rejoin in a few minutes. So we've got the um, Bible reading now. So if you could all turn your Bibles to um, Genesis 3, verses 1 to 13. It's on page 5 in the church Bibles. Now the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to them, called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman put you here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The snake deceived me, and I ate. Thank you, Sarah, very much indeed for that reading. Let's pray for God's help as we study this passage together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your good word And Lord, since we know that Satan loves to attack your word, making us doubt it, 
We pray that this morning you would help our hearts to be soft and teachable, that we would listen to what you're saying to us here this morning. For those of us for whom this is all brand new, we pray that you would open their eyes to see just exactly what has gone wrong with the world. And for those of us who've studied this passage many times before, please may this not be old news. Please may it be fresh to us this morning as we see more clearly the depths of our sin, but therefore more clearly the wonder of salvation. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read to you from Genesis 3, verse 5. I hope you've all got it open in front of you. Incidentally, we've, we're going to start not putting the passage on the screen. So those of you who are at home, if you don't mind um, bringing a Bible with you when you come to join us at church, um, and those of us who are in the building, we'll have a Bible given to each of you on the way in. This partly makes it slightly easier for the tech team, but it's also great to have the Bible open right in front of us so that we can see uh, what is being said and check that it is being said against um, the Bible. So verse 5, this is Satan the snake speaking, God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Look at the news on any particular day and yes, you might see some good news, you might see some celebrations of things that are happening, but sadly you'll also see bad news and that was certainly the case when I looked at the news on Friday and I saw the appalling murder of an MP in a church by someone uh, who attacked him with a knife while he was doing his job as a public servant. It was appalling. And add to that racism, COVID, suicide bombers, fraud, poverty, global warming. What is going on? What's gone wrong with the world? Over the last five weeks, we've been looking at Genesis 1 to 4, and we've uh, just made our way to the end of chapter 2, and we've seen how good everything is, a relationship with our creator, a beautiful garden, the gifts of work and rest and relationships, but now everything unravels. Genesis 3 tells us loud and clear what has gone wrong with the world, the account of the fall, which we're going to look at this week and next week. And although many of us will be familiar with this passage, we cannot view life without this lens. We cannot view life without this lens to understand what has gone wrong in the world on the wider scale and in our own hearts. And actually, as we understand the depth and the gravity of our sin, we get to see the wonder of the cross more clearly. So let's look at this story in three parts, the temptation, the sin, and the consequences. So first of all, the temptation. This will be helpful for us to understand what happened back in the garden all those years ago, but also what happens in our own hearts day by day as well. And in verse one, we meet the snake. Now there's no attempt to explain or defend this talking snake or explain how in a perfect world he came to sow the seeds of temptation and rebellion. You see, there are many questions that the book of Genesis doesn't answer. It raises far more questions than it answers. But we do know from that verse that Simon showed us at the beginning of the service from Revelation that this snake is associated with Satan, a real evil spiritual personality who has himself rebelled against God and who with devastating hatred wants to turn God's people away from him. Now, on the one hand, he is incredibly evil and nasty and crafty, but actually he's no match for God. It's not like there's a battle of two equals. Um, in fact, he's described here as just a creature, just part of the creation. And though that raises questions, it's quite helpful because it reminds us that this is not two equal and opposite people uh, in the boxing ring fighting it out, God versus the devil. devil the devil is just a creature. But... Nevertheless, he is crafty. Also being a creature, he should be underneath the man and the woman. Do you remember we've been seeing that mankind is to rule over the world, to be over the creation. But here it looks like things are beginning to turn topsy-turvy. 
as instead of, uh, instead of humanity over cre creatures, the creature is starting to take uh, authority over humanity. Let's look at three of his tactics, because these are tactics that you will experience this week when you face temptation. First of all, he questions God's word. Let's, uh, let's look at the story. Satan is the, is the master of spin. Verse 1, now the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the women, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God really say? Questions are powerful in and of themselves, aren't they? They sow seeds of doubt in your mind. And this one is already beginning to suggest that God is rather mean. Instead of focusing on the perhaps 999 different trees that they were allowed to eat, eat from, inevitably Satan zeroes in on that one tree that they have to move away from. But more fundamentally, he attacks God's word. He questions God's word. Did God really say? Straight away, there's a lesson here for us. Satan strikes at God's word. God is good, and he relates to us through speech. He gives us loving and protective guidance for, uh, to care for us. But if Satan can undermine confidence in what God is saying, well, he's already onto a winner, and our trust in God is severed. And he still does this a million ways in the home this week. He'll, uh, he'll try and stop you. He'll try and get between you and your Bible to stop you from, uh, from reading it with a thousand more important or urgent things. In theological colleges, he will convince or seek to convince future vicars that the Bible is not up to date or not enough. And in the church on a Sunday morning like this, across the country and across the world, he will be just whispering in people's ears, oh, you don't need to listen to this. Oh, it's not quite right. Don't listen to what the Bible is saying. He, see, he sows seeds of doubt and distraction. He seeks to put a gap between us and God's word. He is crafty, but actually he's not massively original, and he's been doing this for thousands of years, and he continues to do it today. He questions God's word. Secondly, he denies God's judgment. Let's just do a bit of spot the difference. Look back to chapter 2, where we were last week, and uh, 2 verse 16. Here we have God's original prohibition on not eating from this tree. And then let's spot the difference with what Eve, how Eve retells the story in chapter 3. So 2, verse 16, the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Chapter 3, verse 2, um, show, do you mind just closing the back doors? Thank you. The woman said to the snake, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. God didn't say that. He said you mustn't eat from it. He didn't say you can't touch it. Perhaps this is the beginning of legalism. This is the beginning of humanity adding their rules to what God has said. Don't touch it. It's only a small addition, but right from the beginning of the Bible... Uh, we see humanity uh, adding rules. It seems like she's already been sucked in and she's already relating to God on the wrong basis. And so Satan blatantly denies that God will carry out his punishment. He denies God's judgment. Look at verse four. You will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman. It's so blatant and it's so in your face. Oh, he won't actually do it. it. It's just an empty threat. He's just saying that. He's trying to control you. You won't die. You'll, you'll be absolutely fine. And he does the same to us today. He whispers in our ear that actually, forget the consequences. It won't hurt. It won't matter. There won't be any serious repercussions. You won't face uh, any consequences. 
But tragically, we will die. Hands up if you've been to a funeral over the last year. Yeah, quite a few of us. And for many of us, that will be people in your own families. Who are you going to listen to? A snake, a crafty creature who tells you that you won't die? Or God, who says very clearly that you will? So Satan is crafty. He questions God's word. He denies God's judgment. And thirdly, and perhaps most crafty of all, he questions God's motives. Verse 5, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan whispers, there's a reason why God doesn't want you to take this fruit. He's trying to withhold something from you. He's out to spoil your fun. Don't trust him. The minute you eat it, you will be walking through a doorway into a new world where you get to be like God. And that's ironic, isn't it? Because we've already seen in chapter 2 that we are like God. We're in his image. We're made to be like him in terms of ruling and relating together. But it's not enough to be a little G God, if you like it, to be under God, to be over the earth and to be ruling over his, his planet. They want to be capital G gods. They want to take God's place. You see, they want to know experientially between good and evil. A bit more on that in a moment. But do you see Satan's questioning of motives here? God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. He's out to do anything that will uh, make us think that his good ways are bad ways. He's out. Satan wants us to think that uh, God's just here to spoil our fun. And we can be like teenagers, can't we? It's great to have some teenagers with us. Um, you guys can relax because we're all like this sometimes. We sort of shake our fists at God, our parent, and we say, it's so unfair. You never let me be a grown-up. You just want to make my life miserable. Why don't you let me do the one thing that I want to do when actually God all along is protecting us? He questions God's motives. But we're not robots, and we have free will, and he lets us choose. And so on to the center of the story, the second part, the sin. And actually, uh, the scholars tell us that this is right at the center of this section of Genesis 2 and 3, at the the low point, if you like, the central point of emphasis. And this is the moment where the virus of sin enters the world to do its catastrophic and irreversible damage. Verse 6. When the women saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She's lost already, isn't she? All of her senses and her desires have already been employed in uh, believing Satan's lie. Uh, And just in case that we think that this is all Eve's fault, where has Adam been all this time? He's been right by her side, but he's been silent and completely uh, inactive in protecting his wife as he should be doing. He was the leader born first to protect and cherish his wife, but he's abdicated responsibility and he's completely failed to do what is right. Verse 6b. Uh, So let's have all of verse 6. When the women saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, She took some and ate it, exactly what she was told not to do. And Adam, she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. What is at the heart of this sin? Well, for this, I think we need to go back to verse 5, actually. Knowing good and evil. Now, in what sense are they to know good and evil in a way that they didn't know good and evil before? Satan is trying to tempt them, and he's trying to welcome them into this new world where they get to be the deciders of good and evil. The heart of sin is taking God's place. It's wanting to be on God's throne. And in a sense, Satan was right. Their eyes were opened 
but rather than being liberated and released into a new era of autonomy and freedom, they are chained into shame and chaos. God just said one thing, don't eat from this tree, but they did it. And in doing so, they wanted to take God's place. Now, I guess we all want to come to church on a Sunday to be uplifted and to hear some good news. And I'm afraid that there is no good news at this point in the Bible. The trouble is that we all do this. No one here in church is being singled out in any way this morning. We all do this. None of us inside church are, in a sense, better than anyone outside of church. We are all fallen sinners. Many of us have read this chapter many times, and probably many of you could do a better job than me of giving a talk about this passage. But we all need to hear and to feel afresh the horror of what has been done. You see, we will only be lifted up by the good news, and we will be later on in the service, when we first see the depths of the pit that we have fallen into. We need to feel afresh the horror of what we've done so that in due course we can see the wonder of the gospel. You see, it's easy to have too simplistic a view of sin. Sin is not just breaking rules. Do not walk on the grass. Uh, do not do this. It's, it's actually not about rules. But it's more like making the rules. It's us choosing to be the one that decides what is right and wrong. This means that actually you can do the right thing, but you're doing it because you choose. You can live a really moral life. You can give to the church. You can say your prayers. You can read your Bible because you want to be king and you want to be boss. We don't just need to repent of our bad deeds. We need to repent of our good deeds. We need to repent of us being on God's throne. In Parliament, there is a, a throne, a jewel-encrusted, velvet-embroidered throne where the monarch sits at the state opening of Parliament. And I once heard of a, a group of tourists who were looking around the Houses of Parliament and came to this throne, and uh, the tour guide was sort of turning his back just for a moment, and you can guess what happened. A cheeky tourist snuck behind the rope and just went and had a quick sit on the throne and the tour guide turned back and said what are you doing that's the queen's throne and he said I, I, I think it was an Aussie I just wanted to have a go and we laugh and it's only a it's only a seat and it's it's the queen as much as we love her is just a human she's just a, a sovereign ruler of one state but actually isn't that what we try and do with God we want to have a go behind every sin we seek to sneak onto God's throne pushing him off and living as if we are God inside we want the autonomy to decide <clears throat> between good and evil we've believed Satan's lie that we can be in God's place knowing deciding between good and evil and we've been doing it for so long that we just don't realize how outrageous it is. It started with the first captain of the human race, Adam, and we follow in his footsteps. So essential that we see how far we have fallen. We want to know good from evil. We want to be able to decide. We want God's place. We don't want him there. The temptation, the sin, and the consequences. And we'll see more consequences next week as Sam takes us through the next part of chapter 3. And as we see the sentence that's passed on uh, the creation, the snake, and on uh, Adam and on Eve. But just let's look at two uh, consequences just uh, in our passage today up to verse 13. And the first one is shame. Shame. At the end of chapter 2, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. There was absolutely no shame in the world. But once they've taken from this fruit, other people become enemies and they are threatened. 
and they recognize their nakedness. Verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened. Satan was half right. There was a kind of eye opening, but it wasn't a good one. And they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Lots of artists have had a lot of fun with some fig leaves trying to cover up nakedness in the garden. Actually, we've been making fig leaves ever since. Our fig leaves may look a bit more subtle and a bit more 21st century in terms of our achievements at work or our alternative lifestyle or our Sunday masks that we put on. But they're all attempts to paper over the cracks of what we've done. They're all ways in which we seek to feel better about ourselves. Could it be that if we're really honest, uh, on a Sunday we don't want people to know the real me? We put on the, the fig leaves and the masks. But before God, we can't cover up. We are guilty. But it's not just that they hide from each other. In verse 8, they hide from God as if that was possible. Verse 8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord calls after them with questions. He knows the answer, but he comes after them. He wants to confront them with the seriousness of what they've done, but they go hiding. I've mentioned before the stories of Patricia St. John, um, amazing stories for children, well worth reading even if you're an adult as well. And uh, in one story, Treasures of the Snow, Lucian, who's a slightly naughty little lad, uh, is winding up his next door neighbor, Danny, by holding his kitten over a precipice. They live in the Alps. And he holds this little kitten over, dangling over the precipice to just to make him annoyed. But he actually slips and he actually drops the kitten over this precipice. He didn't mean to, but his kind of taunting of this little boy um, just got worse. And then what's so terrible is that Danny himself launches himself off the precipice to try and rescue his kitten. Spoiler alert, Danny is okay. He breaks his leg terribly, and that's the rest of the story goes from there. But Lucian at this point thinks that he's killed Danny, and he just runs. He runs to the hay shed, and he hides himself. And it's just like what we do. We hide ourselves. Maybe one of the reasons we're so busy in our work is because we hide ourselves in our work. And shame comes into our relationships and into our marriages and into our church and into our relationships. We hide from one another and we hide from God. Well, please don't hide this morning. You're among friends and you are before a holy God who, as we're going to see, comes after you. First of all, shame. And secondly, blame. And we see this in... Uh, Verse 12. Let's just uh, look at these questions that God asks. Verse 9. The Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? And then listen to this, uh, this answer. It's like a double swipe, both at God and at Eve. He's kind of passing the buck. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. It's your fault, God, and it's her fault for giving it to me. The man said, uh, verse 13, sorry, the, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the snake deceived me, and I ate, passing the buck. I'm sure you've heard the old joke, Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the snake, and the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> Workplaces, marriages, schools, factories, homes, shops, they're all places of shame and blame as we seek to hide and pass the buck. Just look at how you react next time you know you're in the wrong. We all do this. As we get to Genesis 3, verse 13, it is a sad story, isn't it? It's a heavy story. It's a difficult story to read and a difficult story to preach on. 
But we're actually beginning to see with God's lenses what has gone wrong with the world. And it's so helpful. It's so helpful when we wear Genesis 1, 2, and 3 lenses and we look at our news feeds and we look at the internet and we see what's happening in the world and we see what's happening in our own lives and we see why. It's because of our rebellion against God that this has happened. G.K. Chesterton was a Roman Catholic uh, thinker and writer of the last century. And once the, uh, the Times, the newspaper The Times, uh, wrote the question and it, uh, addressed it to a number of thinkers of the time and said, what's gone wrong with the world? And uh, it said that G.K. Chesterton uh, wrote a very simple letter. And he just said, sir, in answer to your question, what's wrong with the world? I am. The way in which we begin to understand our world is by beginning to understand our own hearts and knowing that this is us. But before we move on and before we look next week at the further consequences, can I just show you one thing? Yes, God comes to confront Adam and Eve. He shows them what they've got wrong. But could it be that as he comes to convict them and to show them, he also comes to reach out to them? He could have walked the other way. He could have left Adam and Eve stewing in their sin. But graciously, he comes towards them. He takes the initiative. Yes, we are stuck. We're lost. We're hiding in our sin and our shame. But God comes towards them. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. He comes after you, he comes after me, and he's interested in us. He takes the initiative. And later on in the Bible, we'll see that he takes the initiative in sending his son into this world. Later on, we're going to sing, I was lost, but Jesus found me. Found the sheep that went astray, threw his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. It's right that we pause and confess our sin, and we're going to do that in the words of a song and in the words of a confession that Simon is going to lead us through. And uh, this song is a song that Johnny wrote, I think based on the book of Hosea. But don't stay in your sin. Take your sin to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where a fountain of forgiveness was poured out for sinners. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on Jesus. I suggest that we sing this song seated as we uh, think about our, the ways in which we haven't loved God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then Simon will lead us through a confession and then we'll move into a song which takes us into the good news. Let's sing. We have been those who have not done right. We have been those Who've hidden from the light We have been those Full of idolatry We have been those Who lived unfaithfully Forgive our sins, Lord We return to Refresh your people as the morning dew And he will heal our waywardness And his love he freely gives And we will dwell with him the living 
who reject the Lord. We have been those not bowing down in awe. We have been those who have wandered far. We truly are dependent on your scars. Forgive our sins, Lord. We return to As, as I said when we started, it's a somber moment when we look at the story of our own fallenness and our, our own sinfulness. Like, like Adam and Eve, Eve, we've been tempted in so many ways and we've fallen again and again. And if we think about our behavior this week, I'm sure we'll, we'll look back with shame in so many ways. But the, the great things of the gospel is that, as it says in the Bible, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. What a wonderful truth that Jesus, God's son, came to us in our world and shared our temptation, and yet he did not sin. And so if we just, just think for a moment about maybe some of the things we've done this week, then we can read together these words. O King enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory. Holy is your name, Lord God Almighty. In our sinfulness, we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips, to speak your word through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And then we have these wonderful words of assurance. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Amen. And so now we just ask William to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just call out to you 
and we thank you for that assurance of your glorious grace and your matchless love through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you for the privilege of prayer and we pray that you will hear the prayers of those in this room and those who are attending online as we call out to you and come before you in his name. First Lord, we pray for Piak and Nam, our partners in Christian mission, seeking to meet up with and witness to Thai people living in the UK. We pray as they will be attending the OMF Diaspora Returnee Ministries UK Conference later this month at Clover Cloverley Hall in Oswestry. Uh, they say that they will be welcomed as full-time members officially there. So Lord, we pray for them now and we pray for them as they will be uh, preparing to attend the online OMF course and that the way will soon be open for them to uh, meet up with the OMF headquarters in Singapore. We pray for those in affliction of spirit and body. Lord Jesus, our healer and saviour, spread your wings and hands of love upon them and minister unto them in their pain and suffering. We remember uh, little Maxi, a six-year-old boy who suffered a, a traumatic accident and we pray for his full recovery, O Lord. The time of the death of David Amos, MP, we pray for his family and for all those who mourn the loss of loved ones. We pray for your peace and consolation to reach them, O Lord. We thank you for our police service and we pray for them especially as they look into this terrible crime. Uh, nearby to Huntingdon is the village of Leighton Bromswold and George Herbert was rector of that village four year, 400 years ago in the midst of the trauma and the terrors of the English Civil War. With him we pray these words. Teach me, my God and King, in all things thee to see, and what I do in anything, to do it as for thee. We move on to the collect for the day. God, our light and our salvation, illuminate our lives that we may see your goodness in the land of the living and looking on your beauty may be changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'd invite you to say with me the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we, as we come to the end of our service, we're going to be singing the song, I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. We've been reminded that Satan who led us astray was just a creature, but it's the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came and died for us. And that's something for us to celebrate this morning.
So as we come to the end of our service, first of all, thanks so much for coming this morning. It's been good to see you. It's been good to see folk online. Please do stay for coffee afterwards. Also, we'll be having a, a lunch to, uh, to send off our good friends David and Hannah Casey as they, uh, as they move away from Huntingdon. So please join us for that. If you haven't brought some food, there is a convenience store just around the corner. And I've promised not to mention its name, but it does have a blue logo. And if you're... <laughs> If you're sitting at home uh, close by, do please come and join us. It would be great to see you. Thank you, thank you all for coming. And now if we can just uh, close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you that we can sing a wondrous story. There is a Christ who died for each one of us. And I thank you that I can sing that wondrous story because you died for me. I thank you, Lord, for the cross, for what you achieved there. And I thank you, Lord, that you're a great high priest and that you've passed through the heavens and you pray for each one of your people and you sustain us and you'll bring us safe into the presence of your Father. We thank you so much for your death and for your resurrection. Amen. <laughs>